everybody. Welcome uh, to Skype a Scientist Live. Today we have one of the greatest cephalopod husbandry uh, people ever. Husbandry basically means like taking care of animals, breeding them, keeping them healthy in captivity. Um, this is Brett Grassy. He works at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, and they have one of the biggest like cephalopod uh, rearing or raising collections almost anywhere. Um, which is super cool. Um, he used to work at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and if anybody has been to the Tentacles exhibit, that's all about cephalopods. Um, I'm not sure if it's still there. Um, is it still there? It's still there. They're still closed down at the moment, but okay. um, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so Brett knows a lot about how to keep a cephalopod healthy. Cephalopods are octopus, cuttlefish, squid, and nautilus. Um, and I am also a squid biologist, so this uh, session is near and dear to my heart. Um, so feel free to get your questions in. Um, at this point, oh, uh, other things happening this week. Tomorrow, we're going to be doing Squid Senses uh, with Carly York. That's going to be happening tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, on Thursday night for adults, we're doing uh, trivia all about cephalopods. Um, all of the questions won't be about cephalopods, but there will be a lot of squid questions. And then um, Friday, we're talking about cuttlefish uh, with Maria Chavez. That's going to be at 1 p.m. as well. And then we're going to we're going to do something a little uh, weird and different this week. We're going to try to do a live streamed. Uh, tabletop gaming session that's going to be all squid themed. So you're going to learn about squid as we play through the game and there will be games for the audience as well. Um, there's a squid biologist who worked at MIT in the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. His name is Casey Zakharoff and uh, he basically designed the whole game for us. So that's going to be really fun. Mm -hmm. We're also going to be joined by um, shark biologists and uh, artificial intelligence scientists uh, for that game as well. It's going to be a good time. Um, but for now, let's uh, have Brett introduce himself, say who he is, what he does, why he likes it, and then we will get into all of your cephalopod questions. Yeah, all right. Well, thanks, Sarah, for the great introduction. Hello, everybody out there listening. Um, Sarah mentioned my name is Brett Grassi. My title is uh, the manager of cephalopod operations, and I work at a uh, uh, at a quaint little uh, historic facility called uh, the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. And um, I've got the very uh, unique job of getting to manage a world-class cephalopod lab where we breed and raise uh, a variety of different cephalopods to support research and biological discovery. So it's a pretty exciting time and um, it's a great opportunity to kind of network with the various uh, scientists out there like Sarah and, and uh, others throughout the, the planet Earth, and we can kind of work as a more cohesive unit to try to look at these uh, amazing animals, these cephalopods, in a little bit more detail than um, we've been able to in the past due to these uh, culture and, and breeding um, efforts that we've been putting forth. So, Awesome. So what kinds of animals, Brett, do you have in the lab? So... Um, to start with, we were trying to focus on cephalopod species that are very small, that have very short lifespans, and that are have predictable reproduction. So we didn't want to have, uh, we didn't want to select cephalopod species that were, uh, you know, the most difficult out there to culture because it wouldn't gain a lot of traction in the research community. We need to have user-friendly uh, organisms that uh, folks can work with, and so. Uh, the main species that we for, uh, have been uh, working with um, initially here are all fitting those, those same criteria, and those are uh, the bobtail squids. We, we typically work with two, so one, one species is uh, what Sarah's uh, career has been really primarily focused upon, um, and, and that's the Europrim, the Sculpies, the Hawaii bobtail squid, and we also have their sister species from Okinawa, the hummingbird bobtail. Um, we also have a small uh, stumpy spine cuttlefish, Sepia bandensis, we've got cultures of them going. We've got the beautiful flamboyant cuttlefish as well, uh, native to Australia, uh, Indonesia area. We have uh, the California two-spot octopus from California, and we have um, the pygmy zebra octopus native to Nicaragua and kind of the Pacific side of Central America. Um, so we do have a nice, uh, group from all all around. Oh, we also have uh, striped pajama squids, which are a cute little species uh, native to Australia. So we've got a, a good uh, group from around the world, and um, they all share those main criteria that I mentioned earlier. Awesome. 
Um, so here is a question from Gavin. Why are the suction cups on octopus and squid so suction-y? <laughs> well, that's a really good question. And, um, you know, I think there's a variety of answers that, that could be applied there. But I think for just generally speaking, they use those suction cups as kind of the gateway at which they interact with their environments. And so that can look like a wide variety of things. For, for the, the case of octopuses, um, those suckers not only can grasp and move around and manipulate objects, but they also have uh, chemoreception. So uh, it's sort of like a sense of taste um, that they can generate with those suckers as well. So um, you could imagine these are very, very complex animals because as an octopus is crawling around the ocean reef floor, the vast amount of information that it's getting from all of these suction cups and needing to process is, is really immense. And so um, octopuses have, you know, eight arms and roughly, depending on the species, about 200 suckers per arm. Uh, each one of those suckers is capable of rotating independently and grasping and sucking onto things and, and then also kind of tasting. And so um, if you could imagine, you know, as we stroll around uh, throughout the day, if we tasted everything we walked on, it would be pretty overwhelming and, uh, you know, also disgusting in certain cases. But, uh, but, you know, octopuses have to do this on a routine basis, same with other cephalopods. So they use that for not only interacting with their environment, but determining what is food and what's not, what is potentially dangerous, uh, a predator or something distasteful that they don't want to interact with. And also in order to mate with one another, to grab on to uh, females or males in order to kind of uh, uh, achieve successful mating. Awesome. Um, Ty and mom, Ty's eight years old. Um, how long can octopuses grow? Um, well, octopuses, there's some kind of contradictory theories out there, but I would say typically the, the most widely accepted largest octopus species in size is the giant Pacific octopus, which is native to Alaska, um, the Northern Pacific. And they uh, have been reported, uh, uh, confirmed up to about 15 feet to 20 feet, arm tip to arm tip. Although there are older reports of them being as long as 30 feet long, arm tip to arm tip. Although, um, you know, there's some great pictures and things like that that seem to support that size. It hasn't been officially documented uh, to my knowledge. So uh, still very large. And what's also, also very impressive about that is that they're able to achieve that size in about five years time. So um, cephalopods as a whole are very fast lived organisms, whether they're in our lab or out in the wild. And uh, these giant Pacific octopuses are no exception, even getting that immense size um, at such a, uh, a short time is pretty impressive. For sure. Um, the next question is, do you have any animals with you or uh, are you, you're at home, aren't you? Uh, yeah, the only animals I have are some cats and uh, <laughs> actually some miniature goats outside, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you had goats. They aren't, they're not available to this, for the Skype session today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I um, also don't have any cephalopods at home. They're yeah, a, kind of a pain in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need a little division from work and, uh, and you know, leisure at home. So unfortunately, we don't have any for this Skype call, um, you know, just due to the pandemic and everything. We're trying to work as much from home as possible. Although we do have a, a team that works around the clock seven days a week to feed and perform maintenance and take care of these uh, animals to the highest degree. So. Mm -hmm. But where can um, people check out all the animals that you have on social media? Yeah, so um, the Marine Biological Laboratory uh, does have a Instagram account. Um, I believe also a Facebook page, although I'm not very uh, social media savvy. My apologies. I, I don't know exactly what their title is, but I'm sure you can find them through some simple searches. Um, also, our lab has an Instagram, which is called MBL underscore Seth Lab, um, where we, uh, you know, we've been a little bit um, slower through the pandemic, but we try to post a, you know, picture or two or some of the new developments in the lab every couple of weeks or so. Um, and so you can find us there as well, MBL underscore Ceph Lab. And then, um, you know, just keep, keep a lookout for any of the other general postings that the Marine Biology Laboratory puts out about new discoveries and publications regarding cephalopods. I should also mention, in addition to our culture operations, there are a number of very uh, renowned scientists that also work and do uh, research with these cephalopods year-round at the Marine Biological Laboratory and they work with 
Uh, some other species like the common European cuttlefish, that's uh, Dr. Roger Hanlon, um, with some of our uh, local squid species too, the woods hole long fin squid, um, some other ones uh, as well. So we've got a, a kind of a tight knit cephalopod family down here in, uh, in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Awesome. Um, let's see, the next question is, why do squid have three hearts? That's a good question. Um, basically, they all have different functions. So two of those hearts are going to be to pump blood to the various gills. So, um, you know, this, these group, this group of animals, I should mention, is uh, um, unbelievably impressive uh, for a number of reasons. But one, one uh, in, in particular is that they are more closely related to clams and snails and other mollusks than they are any type of highly local, locomotive, very fast moving fish. Uh, or you know mammal like we are, but yet we give them a lot of the same credit because of their amazing uh, capabilities. And part of those amazing capabilities are are made possible by their impressive anatomy. And so they have a lot of really, really cool different anatomical features, different body parts, different capabilities that um, are why they're so popular and so cool. Um, and one of those is yeah the three hearts. So they've got two that pump the blood to the gills, so they can get a really fast turnaround on oxygenation and then the uh other, the third heart is pumping uh blood through the rest of the body and through the arms and the rest of the mantle and the, the organs awesome um do you know why cephalopods don't live in fresh water well you know as evolution dictates there's just different uh types of critters that are able to cope with certain types of environments and um yeah cephalopods because of their evolutionary heritage just haven't uh been able to find that niche, so, uh, so to speak. And so um, they've been very successful since, you know, pre-Cambrian, long before our, the popular dinosaurs that we all know and love, uh, these cephalopods were inhabiting our, our oceans and have evolved uh, along those times. And um, I'm not sure exactly what the particular reason is besides just their general physiology, but um, they, don't, they don't inhabit fresh water. Um, there's a couple very rare cases of certain squid species that can inhabit close by sort of estuarine habitats uh, near river runoffs, but uh, in large, yes, they're not suited uh, physiologically for freshwater. Yeah, I think the lowest they get is four parts per thousand, which, and so seawater is like 32, 35 parts per thousand, and then freshwater is closer to zero, and the lowest anybody's found any is four parts per thousand, which is in like North Carolina, around there, there's this little squid um, that, sometimes goes there but only for part of its life it can't live there all the time it just goes there for like a little bit of time um so yeah they just don't do it yeah. um all right the next question is um let's see so i've heard that octopuses can use camouflage is that true and does that depend on the species from grant age 10. yes definitely um that's a really great question because i think generally we think of octopuses as these amazing shapeshifters and you know, kind of the Houdinis of our of our ocean realm, and um, they certainly do uh, they they certainly do live up to that reputation. There's a lot of species out there that are unbelievably gifted at camouflage, and I would say that um, you know confidently that there's no other animal on planet Earth that even comes close to these cephalopods with their ability to blend in and shapeshift their bodies, uh, their skin color, and their skin texture in order to blend with in with their surroundings like that. So uh, we are looking at a very highly specialized group of animals. Um, I will mention though that it's, you, your question is very spot on in that not all species do this. So um, some octopus species have much more vast um, expansions of these camouflage capabilities and others really don't have a need for that and will maybe only show one type of color or a couple types of colors. Um, depending on the habitat they live in or depending on their repertoire of behaviors. Um, obviously for certain species like our deep sea species of like flapjack octopus and vampire squid and things like that where there's no visible light down there um, that penetrates at those depths, uh, these animals don't have as much of a need for that camouflage as the, sh as the shallow water relatives. Um, however, that being said, I've been fortunate enough uh, to work with flapjack octopus and vampire squids uh, in person uh, when I was at the Monterey Bay Aquarium working with our sister institution in Bari. And I can tell you that even uh, some of these very, very deep sea cephalopods that are down thousands of feet still have the capability of being able to change color, which is still kind of a mystery why they retain that ability. 
yeah, they just like never lost it. It's just sort of like, sometimes evolution just, things just happen that way and then we want an answer for it, but we're just like, it is what it is, you know? (laughs) Um, So we're kind of related. Do all cephalopods ink? Um, I don't believe so. I think there's always a couple exceptions to the rules. Uh, Sarah, you might be able to expand on this one a little bit more, but um, you know, so it's interesting enough that some of the earliest fossils uh, with cephalopods, why they were determined to be cephalopods was due to the presence of these ink sacs that can be maintained over, you know, millions of years in the fossil records. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know, sir, can you, do you know what species don't ink? I know there are a couple. I, they exist and they, they're yeah. in the deep sea and that's mostly we think because again, there's no light so you don't, there's not as much of a need for it. Um, yeah. Though some deep sea cephalopods still do ink and we think that they use that for like um, basically smelling each other out. Um, mm-hmm. So finding each other for mating. But um, I don't know off the top of my head who does not. I just know that there are a few that don't. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, off to Agreed. Yeah, sorry I couldn't get more specific, but uh, there's always some exceptions to the rules out there. For sure, especially with cephalopods because they've been around for 500 million years. So if there's a thing that an animal could evolve to do, like they've had a lot of time to kind of branch out and do all of those things. Um, but what do all cephalopods have in common? Well, um, all cephalopods have a few things in common. So they're mollusks, meaning... Uh, well, they're mollusks, so like I said earlier, they're more closely related to snails, clams, other bivalves, uh, more so than they are, um, you know, fish, uh, mammals, etc. Um, part of mollusks is that they have uh, something called a toothed tongue, and of course, they're, they're, which is known as a radula. Um, of course, there are also always exceptions to all of these rules. Um, so there's certain cephalopods that have had kind of uh, evolved sort of uh, appendages to either have, um, you know, for, let me just uh, give you a one quick exception to the rule. So vampire squids, you know, we could say that all cephalopods have, have arms or tentacles, but vampire squids, again, have sort of uh, been that exception to the rule where they have these two long uh, filaments, which, again, it's all kind of based on definitions. Um, but uh, you know there there are definitely some general commonalities that I'll say that most cephalopods exhibit. So um, you know the word cephalopod itself means head foot. So um, their anatomical arrangement is such that their feet, um, which again those can come in a wide variety of different uh, types. They can be tentacles, they can be arms, they can be filaments. And really the important thing to know is that they're all hydrostats, which are uh, basically like what our tongue is. It's, um, it's, it's a, uh, a muscular uh, uh, entity that can basically use the uh, peristaltic pressure to move and bend and shape and, and, and morph around. And so, um, you know, they have these feet that are attached to their head. So that's kind of the general um, commonality that they all share. And then, of course, off of that foundation, they get very strange and weird and all sorts of different adaptations and uh, ways to survive with their environment. So... Some have uh, two tentacles, like a lot of our squids and cuttlefish, along with their eight arms, or they have uh, more dexterity with their eight arms, like our octopuses. And um, and you know sometimes uh, uh, they they have all sorts of other um, types of strange, peculiar oddities, like um, size differences and and adult males and females. Blanket octopus, for instance, um, you know also blanket octopus can. Uh, you know, hold on to jellyfish tentacles and they, they don't get stung by them. So there's just a wide variety of evolution with these cephalopods making them very different. But I would say, generally speaking, the head foot, uh, the fact that they're all mollusks and share general mollusk uh, characteristics is what they have in common. For sure. Cool. Um, so you've, you're working with these animals all the time. You're around them all the time. Can you get a sense of how they uh, might express feelings? Like, how do you know when a cuttlefish that you're working with is like generally happy with itself and generally angry. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's part of what makes our job really fun and, and, and unique is that um, cephalopods communicate 100% externally through the color and texture of their skin. So they don't have any um, uh, audio communication that we know of uh, like most animals do. So that affords us a great opportunity that, that we get to kind of learn how to speak cephalopod over the years. And so um, after you have so many years of working with these animals in the lab and you can 
tell when they're hungry based on their color patterns or based on their swimming patterns or the behavior, you can ascertain or, or develop certain ideas of what they're trying to tell you and what they need through the different stages of their life, which is very rewarding to kind of have that personal relationship with these cephalopods and, and understand what they need and be able to provide the most ideal and optimal care for them while they're with us. Great. Um, what's the smallest cephalopod? You know, I, I'm not sure if there's a, an official consensus on this, but I, there's, there's a number that come to mind. Number one is this very tiny pygmy squid over in Australia. The genus is called Idiosepius. Um, often they're mistaken for baby squids of larger species, but they never get much, much larger than the, uh, a pencil eraser. So extremely, extremely small. Um, so it kind of depends on where you measure them from and how, if you include arm tips and things of this nature, but there's also um, a very tiny octopus species called octopus wolfi, um, which is quite small, about the same size. Um, octopus micropiercis um, is a small lilyput octopus that lives in California in the uh, holdfast of kelp, which is also very small. So I think, um, I don't know if there's necessarily a, a official smallest species out there. Maybe Sarah, maybe you have uh, some thoughts on this. But I would I think, have said those too, so I'm with you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think depending on what country you're in and who you ask and what research right. you ask and what you know history they've had with these various species, you might get different answers. Um, but those are the ones that come come to uh, mind: octopus wolfi and the, the Idiosepius pygmy squid, mm -hmm. native to like Indonesia, Australia area. Pygmy squid are so cute and silly. And you like if you look at them with just your human eyes, you kind of can't really tell what they're doing because they're so small. It's like kind of hard to imagine what they're doing. But there are these videos really zoomed in, and you can see them using basically like glue to that they make themselves to stick themselves onto blades of seagrass. So you see them like hanging upside down, just sort of like pivoting their silly little heads, um, looking for food, and it is incredibly cute. So you should look up like pygmy squid seagrass um, on YouTube and it's going to be a good afternoon for you. Um, that's my mind. <laughs> I add it. one thing onto that too. This, the pygmy squid, another really cool thing about them is that they're one of the few species that has been shown to use their ink as a decoy to hunt. So they'll shoot a little glob of ink in front of a shrimp so that the shrimp is focused on this tumbling ball of ink. And meanwhile, they can sneak up behind the shrimp and attack it without the shrimp uh, knowing. So it's yeah. another kind of cool thing that these little tiny squids can do. That's a, that actually brings us to another one of our questions. We want to talk about all the ways that cephalopods use ink. And I think that's probably my favorite way cephalopods use ink. We've already talked about how they um, can sort of give a little scent trail for other squid to find them. Um, but what other ways do cephalopods use ink? Yeah, um, so cephalopods, um, actually, they, they use ink in a wide variety of very interesting and cool ways. So we touched on a few earlier, but another um, aspect of, of how they use it is um, they can use it almost like a, a, a smoke screen, which is, I think, what a lot of people are most commonly uh, used to, to understanding cephalopod ink. You know, a predator, maybe a hungry eel, so to speak, comes over, tries to attack an octopus. It, it, it um, releases a large uh, kind of like a smoke screen of ink concealing the octopus. It can jettison away to safety. Um, so I think that's the most common. But uh, to me, one of my more favorite ones is, uh, is made, made uh, in part by one of Sarah's favorite cephalopods, little bobtail squids. Um, so when they're evading predators, they can do something called uh, a pseudomorph, which means they can release a little blob of ink that essentially looks like the same size and shape that they are. And they can release a number of these. And so as Sarah knows, uh, when you're out in the field around Hawaii, like looking for these little squids and they're running away from you, Sometimes it can be challenging because they'll release these little pseudomorph blobs that look just like them. And sometimes they even have little wisps of ink that look like little tentacles and arms on either side. Um, so that's another interesting way that they use their ink to make these pseudomorphs. So um, they can make the, the predator again bites that pseudomorph and they can jettison out of the way. Um, and then as Sarah mentioned also, they, they use it as kind of a, a distasteful deterrent. So um, Typically speaking, ink doesn't have very um, tasty chemical properties. So as the predator uh, may be biting on or getting that ink in their mouth, they're more concerned with what that kind of disorienting sort of taste and clouded vision is rather than where that tasty cephalopod went. Totally. All right. What, this is going to be maybe the hardest question of the day. 
Uh, what is your favorite cephalopod? Oh boy. Um, that is tough. I, I think I have to get, I, I'm gonna give two answers. I can cheat, right? So totally. um, <laughs> I think my favorite cephalopod in my career, in my lab and things, has to be uh, the flamboyant cuttlefish just because they're so beautiful and um, just their rippling colors and their pulse, pulsing hypnotic colorations uh, are really pretty spectacular and kind of, you know, that kind of color um, exemplified in such a small animal, you know, they don't get much larger than a couple inches is, is really pretty spectacular. Um, if you guys are able to look up YouTube videos, if you haven't seen one in per person, this, if you see this pulsing, Kind of coloration they're able to do that after only about three months of being or sorry three weeks of being born and so you think of ourselves at three weeks of age and what we're capable of and then you see these flamboyant cuttlefish able to uh, coordinate these tiny pigmented cells in order to expand and contract to reveal these uh this amazing coloration is is pretty special so that that i think is my favorite career animal um even even beats out vampire squids and dumbo octopus and all those other good ones and i think my favorite uh cephalopod that I have not gotten to work with in person, uh, which what I would love to is the blanket octopus. So if you guys haven't seen a video of them, uh, of the large females, um, they're absolutely mesmerizing and uh, absolutely worth checking out. They look like uh, superheroes of the sea and it just looks like something James Cameron would create in a movie Hollywood studio uh, more so than you'd find out in the ocean. So check yeah, it out. Blanket really octopus. Really stunning. Yeah. yeah. Um, I saw one, I was uh, in Hawaii at the, um, the Bishop Museum and I saw a blanket octopus in a jar and I felt like I was personally seeing a celebrity. Like they're so, <laughs> so cool. Um, yeah, I think my favorites are the Caribbean reef squid and I don't know why, I just think they're beautiful and fun and cute and like interactive and personable in the wild. And then the giant Australian cuttlefish are just so big and weird and great. Um, yeah. And complex behaviorally i just love it um all right uh what do you feed all of your cephalopods in the lab good question so uh depending on the species we like to you know basically mimic what they'd be getting naturally out in their in their wild habitat their wild diet and so um they their diet does change throughout their life stages and so when they're very young often we'll feed them um small crustaceans like uh, mycid shrimps or amphipods uh, things of that nature and then as they grow, we need to graduate them onto larger food sources and different types of uh, nutrition. So we like to kind of diversify their diet and, and include um, crabs, for instance, for some octopus species uh, and some cuttlefish species. Uh, we'll diversify certain other squid species with um, grass shrimp or glass shrimp, um, also some types of feeder fish. And so we really just like to keep it pretty uh, dynamic and diverse depending on the species. That's cool. Um, the next question is, uh, how are cephalopods born? Um, well, cephalopods are <clears throat> born out of little eggs. So depending on the species of cephalopod, they may have different sizes or shapes of eggs or different quantities of these eggs. And so um, some of them can look like kind of like much larger versions of kind of frog eggs, if you've ever seen those. Um, oftentimes, uh, they're stuck in the insides of uh, kind of dark overhangs or uh, in highly differentiating kind of coral locations so that the eggs stay safe uh, and, and away from predators. And so, um, so after these eggs are laid, there, there's an incubation period of anywhere from a couple weeks up to actually four and a half years, which is the most extreme case. Um, it's actually the longest incubation period out of any animal uh, that we know of on planet Earth belongs to a deep sea uh, octopus species. They, their incubation happens actually four and a half years. Um, but typically speaking, they're much shorter incubation uh, times, about two or three weeks. And the uh, baby cephalopod either emerges as a perfect miniaturized replica of the adult, which is the kind of the case with uh, bobtail squids and a lot of the squids and cuttlefish and octopuses that we work with in our labs. Um, and then some, uh, some species, they emerge from their eggs um, in what's called a paralarval stage. So they actually look a little bit um, a little bit different than their adult form. So in the case of some octopus species, when they hatch in these paralarval stages, they actually look a little bit more like uh, tiny squids than they do baby octopuses. And over uh, a couple of weeks, they go through a kind of a very loose sort of metamorphosis and look more like their adult uh, forms. Or, um, so 
Uh, in general, they're they're born out of eggs, kind of like you know uh, frogs or other other types of uh, of animals you may be more familiar with. Um, and they have two two different type of um, uh, life stages uh, post hatching that they can kind of uh, uh, go on depend, depending on the species. Awesome. Um, seeing baby cuttlefish hatch is so cute. It I just it breaks my heart because they're just little baby adults in it. I can't handle how cute it is. It's my favorite thing to watch. Um, uh, one of the questions also in, in here is, are they very cute? And the answer is yes. Yep. <laughs> Overwhelming. Yes. Um, let's see. Here, here's a fun question. What is the Kraken and is it real? Well, you know, the Kraken is a mythical beast. I don't, I don't have a, uh, an in-depth history of the Kraken that I can give you, but just generally it's a, uh, it's a mythical uh, terror that lurks deep below the ocean surfaces and was, has been responsible historically for pulling large ship, ships and ocean vessels down under the waters and uh, to their watery grave. And, uh, you know, it had a lot of popularity through um, pirate lore and, and folklore back in the back in the earlier days. And, um, you know, does it exist? I think that's up to your own uh, interpretation. You know, I, I, I kind of joke in that, um, you know, it wasn't until very recently that we uh, finally captured giant squid, a healthy giant squid alive on video uh, with all the technology that exists. So uh, in the oceans, because of the salt content of the water, um, because of the depths that some of these uh, animals live at, it's very, very difficult to study them in ways that we can see because we need to shine bright lights in order to see them. Uh, we need to use robotics and, and things that might scare them away. So. Um, I personally believe that there are some really incredible unknown discoveries in different species, uh, absolutely cephalopods that are down there just waiting to be kind of discovered. Um, and whether it's a kraken or not, I'm not sure, but uh, you know, nothing surprises me with cephalopods. So that's true. Nothing surprises me with cephalopods either. Because um, imagine, you know, you're a giant cephalopod of some kind. You're living deep in the ocean. You've never seen a light before. Like, even if you turn on the light while you're sleeping, how unpleasant is that for a human that's used to light? So imagine you've never seen a light before and then floodlights get shine at, shined at you. Like, you wouldn't stick around for that. So the fact that we've even seen the number of cephalopods that we have is kind of amazing to me, that they don't just like get the heck out of there immediately. So we gotta figure out another way to find these guys. Yes. Um, and but if some of you out there are wondering, you know, if, if you can take an ROV or a submersible down and just shut off the lights and wait for the cephalopods to come to you and then turn on the lights, uh, trust me, uh, scientists have tried. <laughs> and uh, yeah. they've tried, yeah. they've, they've spent, you know, hundreds of times, thousands of times doing different types of tactics like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, essentially it's like looking for, you know, this thing, looking for a needle in a haystack. It's like looking for the tiniest, black needle and the biggest black haystack uh, out there because you know the ocean is three-dimensional yeah. um they're not confined with gravity like you know even birds and things that are in our terrestrial environment need to come down to planet earth to lay eggs and to feed and things like that so we're confined with gravity the ocean doesn't live by those confines so they have three-dimensional space and it's a vast vast depth uh, of this space and so what's actually going on down there uh, is absolutely still a, a, a total mystery totally um, very cool. Uh, so the next question is, as a scientist, what do you do in your spare time? Well, um, a lot of different things. I like to uh, grow a garden. So we've got different vegetable gardens and I like to go, uh, my, my happy place has always been the ocean, which is probably why I was attracted to being, uh, you know, to, to this career path and to working as a marine biologist. So uh, my happy place is out on my little Boston whaler out on the ocean. Uh, you know, fishing or hanging out. And so um, just a wide variety of outdoor stuff, biking, kayaking, all that kind of fun stuff. Awesome. Um, are there any endangered squid? That's a really good question. Um, to think about that. I'm sure that there are some numbers that have been concern, uh, concerning. You know, I, I know there's certain uh, spawning aggregations like the giant Australian cuttlefish that, um, that was alluded to earlier. And uh, you know, certain time, certain years, that that species has been um, very limited with their with their uh, mating uh, populations and things. Their ups and downs of their populations. So there's definitely been calls where 
Um, you know, there's been protected coastlines and things like that to try to protect their breeding grounds and their laying grounds. But as far as endangered squid, um, not to my knowledge, I know that the Nautilus were the first cephalopod uh, to be included on the CITES list. And this was as of, I think, two years ago. So very recently, um, I would imagine if any other cephalopod species was highly endangered, they would have been entered in on that. Um, I, I should mention though that cephalopods in general um, are very understudied compared to a lot of other uh, very common marine organisms out there like marine mammals, um, turtles, sea turtles, sharks, things of that nature. So some of their population numbers aren't as well known as maybe some of the more popular kind of charismatic megafauna like the ones that I mentioned. So these sharks and, and things like that. So um, I don't know, do, do you know, uh, do you have anything to add to that? I don't, so the only thing I have to add is that um, a lot of times when you go to look up whether a species is endangered or not, if we don't have enough information, it just says data deficient. And that's often true for cephalopods, particularly the deep sea ones, because we may have only seen one of these species like once alive. And so how the heck do we know if they're, if they're doing okay or not, if we just discovered them a week ago? So um, I think Nautilus is still the only officially listed endangered um, cephalopod to my knowledge, um, but I may have, have missed something. Um, I, also, I think this is a good time too, Sarah, to mention that um, it's a good plug to protect the Nautilus. Yes. Um, if any of you out there um, are familiar with Nautilus shells, they're very beautiful. They have a kind of a logarithmic, it's a mathematical kind of curve to them and a, and a partitioning within the shell. It's very beautiful and it's been very common as decorations. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess one of the biggest detriments to their wild population is people buying those shells. So. If you see one online for sale or at a store, please do the species a favor and don't purchase it because yeah. um, you're just basically incentivizing and, and um, supporting, um, you know, uh, killing that species, unfortunately, because that's one of the most common reasons why they're collected is for that uh, ornamental shell. Definitely, that was a good point. There's also um, a guy named Greg Barord. He has the Save the Nautilus uh, Fund and, and SaveTheNautilus.com. He's a cephalop uh, cephalopod researcher who focuses on Nautilus and also um, goes to Fiji, I believe, um, and works with local folks there to, to help protect those animals. Um, he's doing cool work. Um, awesome, okay, next question. Um, let's see. Um, do we know ballpark how many squid there are in the world? Last I checked, I think it was somewhere around, I think it's 300 or, it's, I can't remember if they're 200 or 300. Um, uh, 300, yeah, they're the 300. Cuttlefish is 200, and octopus, I believe, is what? Are they the 800 or 600? I wanted to say that there were 700 species of cephalopod total, 300 squid, and then the other numbers, I don't even know, because I'm yeah. focused on squid. I, I um, think, yeah, I think it varies. I, thank you for that. I'm also I, learning all the time, so like, total. that's probably and, right, because yeah. when I first learned that number, it was 15 years ago, and yeah. we've discovered so many cephalopods since then that it's uh, the number's always going up. And I, sh I should also mention that there are a lot of cephalopods out there that are new species that have not been categorized as such or the taxonomy is changing all the time. So for yeah. instance, bobtail squids and the pygmy squids um, that we've been talking about are actually probably more closely related to cuttlefish uh, mm -hmm. than squids, than, a, than what you would think of as a squid. So there's like a lot of kind of um, uh, not not clear boundaries between some of the cephalopod taxon taxonomy as far as how many species there are. Like Sarah says, it changes every single year. Totally. And so um, I, th I think last I heard it was like 800 total species, 300 are squid, most of them are octopuses, mm -hmm. and then the rest, there's only maybe 150, I think, of, of, or so of cuttlefish. Something that like sounds that. right. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, but things are constantly changing. The more we do... Um, looking at the genetics of cephalopods, kind of the more complicated things get. Um, and even like there's a, a reef squid that's gorgeous in um, Australia and Japan and all through the Indo-Pacific. And we used to think it was one species and now we think maybe it's actually three species. So, you know, it's, it's a mess. Uh, speciation is always such a complex topic. It's more complicated than what you learn in school. That's for sure. 
Um, okay, so we try to keep these sessions to um, 45 minutes and I could talk about squid for five hours straight, um, particularly with you, Britt, but uh, it's time to wrap it up. So we always ask people the same two questions, well, three questions at the end of sessions. First, is there anything that you wish we asked you today um, that you'd like to tell us about? Um, I guess not, not necessarily that you didn't um, ask it. I just maybe just want to give a, just kind of a general plug for cephalopods is we talked a lot about, um, you know, what makes them so cool, but I just, there's a lot of other things that we didn't touch on. So um, we know that they're, you know, um, you know, un unmatched with their ability to change the color and texture of their skin. Um, that's probably what they're most famous for. Um, but other things, you know, they just have extreme exaggerations compared to a lot of other organisms on our planet. So, um, you know, the giant squid is, um, you know, it has the big, we talked about that earlier, it does have the largest eyeball in the animal kingdom. So they can get about the size of a basketball or larger. Cephalopods in general also have the largest eye to body size ratio out of any uh, animal. So very, very large eyes and, and they're also very complex. So they have a camera like eye like we do where they have a, a lens that focuses an image onto a retina, um, big optic lobes for processing that. And so there's a lot of similarities that they have between uh, um, that kind of make a bridge between invertebrates and these, you know, these ocean animals and then also complex vertebrates like ourselves and uh, you know, other mammals. And so uh, they have these large complex eyes, like I mentioned, they're also the fastest aquatic invertebrate um, out there because of their ability to jet propulse. Um, they have the largest brain to body size ratio uh, out of any um, invertebrate. So very, very large centralized brains. Um, and they, uh, even in addition to that large centralized brain, um, certain species like the octopus have two thirds of their neurons outside of that centralized brain. So very distributed nervous system. That's also very different. Um, we've recently found that they can edit their RNA, which is kind of like the building blocks for future DNA. Um, they've got very complex and large genomes. Um, they've got blue blood, they've got three hearts, you know, the, the list goes on and on and on what, what, what makes them so cool. And um, I just wanted to kind of mention some of those other highlights to get you all interested in cephalopods besides some of the, the things they're most notorious for. Awesome, thanks. All right, the last two questions are, what's one thing that you wish everybody in the world knew about cephalopods? And then the second question, which will be our final question is, what's something that you wish everybody in the world knew about literally anything? It can be as silly and insignificant or like big and important as you'd like. I guess one, one uh, kind of talking point that I always like to get out there is that, um, you know, a lot of folks, um, talk about cephalopod intelligence a lot. And I just like to kind of give my talking point on that is that um, often cephalopods are considered the most intelligent invertebrate out there. And I'm not saying that they're not, they absolutely um, could be. They're very sophisticated animals. Their behavior is extremely sophisticated and complex. Um, but I do just want to say in general, we should be careful about how we use the word intelligence because um, I think we, you know, as humans, we think that we're very intelligent and understandably so. We are pretty, a pretty smart species, um, but we often think that any other species that is like us is also intelligent. So um, I think in particular with octopuses, um, because they live in little homes, little dens like we do, because they take out the trash like we do, because they can unscrew jars like we can, um, it's, it's often thought that, boy, they're, they're the smartest animals in the ocean. And um, I don't mean to take anything away from octopuses because they are very gifted and very um, sophisticated and intelligent within uh, their own kind of context within an octopus. But I just wanna say that their, their, their intelligence is different than our intelligence, which is different than um, a praying mantis's intelligence versus a dog's intelligence. Um, an octopus is very good at being an octopus. And so because it can unscrew a jar, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's highly intelligent. Um, my example I always like to use is that, you know, a dolphin can't unscrew a jar, but that doesn't mean that a dolphin is any less intelligent than an octopus. Uh, they're just differently gifted. So, uh, you know, octopus in particular interact with a very complex environment in order to get food and in order to avoid becoming food. They manipulate that environment to see what's a clam or what's potentially a predator. And so when they're manipulating these objects that we give them in aquariums, like a bottle, for instance, that has a tasty crab, it's a very similar behavior as they would be conducting out on the natural reef. 
And so I just wanted to uh, make that quick little mention about octopus and other cephalopod intelligence is that we should definitely respect uh, their abilities and their amazing mental capabilities and, and, and physical gifts. Um, but I think we just need to be careful about just generally jumping to the fact that they're super smart because uh, intelligence and, and uh, being smart is uh, in the eye of the beholder. It's, you know, it's up to, it's, it's a bit subjective. So that was one thing I want to say about cephalopods. Yeah. And then in general, um, what's something that we, that I'd like everyone to know? Um, mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'm not really sure. I guess uh, just thanks for your enthusiasm with cephalopods. I think it's because of uh, audiences like you that make um, studying these animals so interesting and so fun. Um, getting your, all your guys' ideas and feedback and interest, I think, is, um, is, is really kind of why Sarah and I get in, got into the careers that we did as well, because we're very similar to all of you. So, um, I guess just uh, the last thing I wanted to know is, or to say is just, you know, thanks for your interest. Thanks for your enthusiasm. Um, you know, let's keep being nice to one another as human beings. And, uh, and yeah, hopefully um, we'll all kind of learn more about uh, this group of animals as the interest and research continues. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Uh, I love talking about cephalopods so this was a great uh, a great session for me thanks uh for everybody who came today thank you aaron also aaron you're wearing an octopus shirt today hell yeah that is great thank you for uh coming dressed for the occasion beautiful um okay so uh tomorrow we're talking about squid senses at 1 p.m um we're talking about cuttlefish specifically on Friday. We're going to play a game at Friday night at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, you can check out the Skype a Scientist website for more information there. Um, other than that, Brett, where can we find you on social media? Can we find you on social media? No. Yeah, I'm, um, I kind of am in the, in the background of the MBL Cep Lab, and then my, I have a, a consulting business where I help yeah. scientists and um, public aquarium uh, folks uh, basically provide the best care for cephalopods. So mm -hmm. my consulting business is called eight arm assistance. Um, like you're helping, giving someone help. Uh, so you can find me, I'm on Instagram at eight arm assistance as well. Um, right. and definitely follow MBL underscore Ceph lab. I put that in the chat as well. Um, because they post a lot of good stuff, uh, all of the cephalopods they have in the lab. Um, all right. Well, thank you again. Um, Brett and Aaron for being here today and uh, the rest of y'all will see you later this week. All right. Thank Have you. Fun. Thanks everybody. Thanks.